This episode of This Agile Life has been brought to you by BrilliantAgile.com, providing agile and scrum training, consultancy, and personnel. BrilliantAgile.com. Done right, it's brilliant. Released on Sunday, August 24th, 2014, This Agile Life, Episode 59, Center of Amos Excellence. The software industry transforms more and more every day. Agile methods are quickly replacing traditional ones. The question is, are you agile enough? This podcast is devoted to agile and lean software development. Time to welcome your agile coaches on This Agile Life. Hello, everyone. I'm the host of This Agile Life, John Sextro. Joining me today are my co-host, Lee McCauley. Hey, John. How's it going? It's going well, Lee. How are you? I am doing fabulous. Great to see you here on the Skype. You too. Thanks. Also joining us tonight, Lee, is Amos King. Woo! I'm just back from a hot dog eating contest. I failed, but that's all right. Up at the, uh, the the amusement park in New York. Yep. The Nathan's hot dog Na- eating contest. Nathan's hot dog eating I contest. I thought you looked a little heavier. Oh, I've been on such a hiatus from from the podcast. I miss you guys. You even miss our other co-host tonight, Jason Tice. Oh, oh well, when I said you guys, it wasn't all inclusive. <laughs> hey, Jason. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> we got to do this because once now we have John. And we have Amos. And guys, okay, let's let's roll the clock back a little bit. Remember episode fifty six? What were you? What'd you talk about? You guys can't see John. So we talked about, or you guys had the audacity to talk about the whole team approach. And you're like, you were like, say, because you were the only two guys here. You're like, dude, our other co-hosts, they aren't cutting it, you know. And I'm listening to this after the fact. Lee's listening to this after the fact. And the moral of the story for everyone out there is the little things that you do and the little things that you say, you'd be amazed that they can shoot the whole team approach in the foot. We said it in a public forum. You're the one that talked about open honesty in front of everybody. Oh, my I'm goodness. not allowed to take you into a room and talk to you about it. Uh, uh, well, anyways, <laughs> this way, people these days read between the lines of everything, as you guys know. So my simple statement is be careful what you say out there. And again, I know you were probably razzing us, but you never know. Someone on a team, they might hear someone say something. You know, maybe somebody needs to take some personal time away. And, you know, they really care about what's going on. And, you know, it might come back to haunt them, you know, if somebody makes a comment. So, you know, my thing is to respect people. People, just don't do that. Say, you know, whatever, we're having a good time, you know. Who knows where Jason and Lee are? They're probably having a great time, but... I'm going to have to go back, Amos, and listen to episode 56. It was 56, yeah. See what the offensive things are that we Oh, said. it was just he's, some little been, colors. He's been the dwelling f- on this for a while. So oh, it must have been, it must have been, been horrible. Pent up. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't release my software enough, you know, so uh, sometimes I focus on writing more software versus releasing it, and releasing it is what's actually more important. So did you just release, Jason? <laughs> All I could say is if Amos was just came to us from Explicit a hot dog, tag. <laughs> if he just is coming to us tonight from a hot dog contest, I'm a little nervous about after episode 50, you know, we talked about the cup and what happened with the cup. I don't want to know what Amos is doing down there in, in uh, St. James, Missouri tonight. I, I don't, I don't want to know. But I think we're going to talk about something else tonight, which we're kind of already telling, and that is stories, right? You're right, Jason. You need to take a break in downward facing dog or anything for a few minutes. And- <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yoga. Yoga is an iterative practice just like agile, but that's another episode. Okay. Tonight is about great user stories. Tonight is about great user stories. And we're going to delve more into how to write great user stories and what great user stories might look like. If you listen to or watch the video that I did for episode 58, which was a while back, I took a crack at coming up with some advice and some suggestions for splitting and breaking stories down into into smaller units of work, into smaller stories. So tonight we're just going to take a crack talking about how to go about creating stories, what makes them stories, what makes a story good, what makes a story great, and try and share some of our experiences along the way. So Jason, you had some notes in our in our document here tonight to help get us started. And yes. one of, 
I, I seem to recall the host of This Agile Life asking us to put some effort into some t- talking points. So the thing I thought we could start with was talking about the life cycle of a story and really who should be involved. And this is something where if you listen, if you've listened to prior episodes of This Agile Life, we've kind of been all over the place with, you know, the product owner should write the stories. Amos, or to his credit, advocates for the team to write the stories. <laughs> as well as having other problems, it sounds like. Um, but nonetheless, <laughs> so let's ask Amos. Amos, you got an idea, okay? You just had a brainstorm. You got post-it notes all over the wall, okay, in a sketch. You want to start writing the stories. Who should do that to get started, and what do those stories look like? So we've already determined that this is a feature that is a, a showstopper or our main feature, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's say let's say we've done our brainstorm. We've got rough features, and our business has come through to you know do a high level prioritization. So you know, showstopper. Well, uh, why, you know, why is your brainstorming session not have the whole team? Well, I don't because know. Because if you've Should got post-it it? notes up on the wall, you've probably already been writing stories. That's already a story writing session for the most part, right? Or these very large feature stories. I'm I don't think, know what you're looking at right now. I, I'm thinking this is more of like a like an innovation session. So not necessarily. Okay. There are more ideas. So they okay. might be. They could be features because it could be words that might describe oh. a feature like payment. So I'm just going to say right there that you should have probably had some of the whole team in there at some point through that process. But, okay, so you've got all that done, and you're moving forward. I say that if you're going to start writing stories, you call the team in, the whole team, and everyone sits down and goes through that together because that's when we find out what are the real acceptance criteria, what of this it needs to be done now, what can be done later, how do we split this up, and we can start really planning how we're going to move next. Lee, what do you think? I'm just curious. Um, say the question again. I lost it. <laughs> well, uh, well. So Amos is advocating for, as he's done in the past, like what what I think is a great whole team activity. They, um, you know, where the whole team, if you've got an idea that the business has said we want you to do this next, get the whole team in there and and, and you know do it once where you'll write stories, write acceptance criteria, and that's really going to be scoped to that feature that the business has asked for next. As far as uh, how to uh, going and writing stories for a particular feature in, in one meeting, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, who should be in that room is, my, is the question I'm asking. Well, as many people as, as is possible as far as the development team and the biz- and the customer and as the, the pretty much the whole team. I, I agree with Amos on this. Now, sometimes that's not doable. It's not practical. And so, for example, right now we've got on the team I'm working on right now, we actually have a rotating uh, attendance for that kind of meeting every week so that nobody's in there except for like the tech lead will be in there and the product owner will be in there and the QA will be in there every time and but then uh, two or three of the devs will be in there every week but it's a rotating group how many people are the rotating group whole you're saying two or three are brought in so are there 30 or are there six for the, the whole of the whole team we have eight devs so it's about a third of the team. So every three weeks, you're in there. Yeah, and to be honest, it's for a, I would say one third of the team. It's forcing them to go in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but what about the counter here, which is I guess from Scrum. You know, Scrum would say, you know, writing stories. Obviously, the team needs to be involved, but they would actually probably put the majority of that effort on the product owner. And again, I, I encourage product owners, if they're doing this, to ensure they collaborate with the team. But maybe the product owner gets the story well-defined in the business context. And then, of course, when they're talking to the team, it's more of an activity about sizing and complexity to determine if this is what the business truly needs, You know, how let the team work through the details of how it will be implemented and refine the story based upon the initial draft from the product owner. When you get that story refined down and you have a bunch of smaller stories out of it and you have all the pieces, you also need the product owner and whoever's paying the bills, project manager, all those guys in there, including the team, in order to find out what are we going to do first? Does all of this still need to be done? Are, Are each of these things still part of the overall goal for this time frame? Or can we throw parts of this out so that we can get it out the door faster? That's all part of that story yeah. writing process. Yeah. And I, that's why I think you need everybody. Well, 
I have to say that part of our process right now is um, something like what Jason is talking about, which is the product owner and the tech lead will generally set up or stage some potential stories. They think they've got the story titles and when what the scope of a feature is going to be. And then they have the story writing meeting and that gets fleshed out and maybe broken up and that yeah. sort of thing. But But they do have the feature kind of defined. Yeah, so well, I, that's what I was picturing is all the post-it notes on the wall was like story titles. And back to Jason's point, or Jason's initial statement was maybe the PO by the Scrum methodology, the PO is responsible or accountable for writing stories. I see that my refinement on that is that I think it's good for the, the PO to get things started with writing maybe an epic sort of story. I don't think that the PO is in a position to write stories at the level at which we're going to develop them, right? They start off with like an epic, maybe what you'd call a feature. Hey, this is a story, this is a story, this is a story. And kind of those, back to Amos's thing, back to what those posted were, you know, login, registration, thing, right? Well, that's right. I'm thinking that maybe a good way to explain this and, and try to use some... Um some terminology that's pretty well understood in the Agile space. If a product owner is working with business, maybe or their output they want to create is something like a high-level story map. So you can see features, you can see some type of, you know, call it a business process or a flow, and it's really at almost the screen or the action level. And then really, you could use that story map to define releases, minimal viable product, whatever you want to do. But then really, as you identify those slices of the story map, that's to what Amos is saying, I think we would all advocate for here on This Agile Life. That needs to become the whole team activity to go from that single post-it note on the, on the story map down to multiple stories that speak to that that ideally are thin vertical slices and that have sufficient detail, including acceptance criteria, so they can be implemented. Well, and then acceptance criteria. I think that you should break the story down into pretty much one, maybe two pieces of acceptance criteria. Ooh, per story? That's, oh, yeah, I don't think it should be any more than that. The I more like you that. get, the more muddy the waters get, the more that you have to remember to do, the more likely you are to miss something, and the more work that QA has to do when they're, or the client, when they're accepting the story finally. I like that. I'd love to know if anyone out there, I was going to put it on Twitter. I'm trying to do the social media thing here. Today I did my 100th tweet. Woo! I know, I'm not very good at it. But has anyone been on a team that would go so far as to have a policy that would be like, we shall only have, you know, no more than two acceptance criteria per story or one acceptance criteria? I, I yes. wonder how that would work. You yes. have? Tell us about yes. it. Yes. Given when then was what you had to do. So given is your setup before when is some action that a user would take. And a then you were, we were only allowed to have one then and you couldn't have the word and. And if or, you had the or. word and or but any of those that split into another story. So Amos, I guess what I'd love to hear about, cause I've heard of teams trying to do this and the, you know, when they say we're going to do the one or two acceptance criteria per story. And the pushback is when they get into, you know, complex scenarios, the overhead of writing the story exceeds the value that the separate stories provides. Absolutely false. Really? Well, tell Absolutely us. Absolutely false. Because whenever you start to write that story, the overhead that you're talking about is thinking about that story. It's you figuring out what's going on and what really needs to be done now at what I would consider that is the last responsible moment, not when you're sitting there at the table by yourself with less than the whole team available. So you have the most resources at hand to answer any questions that you have and determine those acceptance criteria, and it has the whole team pre-thinking about it and agreeing upon what needs to happen. And there are little decisions that will happen because you will still miss it, but we need to measure our progress on what we think, not on how, how much we type. No, I agree totally. I agree philosophically, Amos. I do think that there is a little bit of overhead just in any story going through the board, right? There's some overhead in that. So um, so here is... Wait, Jason. I, I saw you trying to get in. Wait for just a second. So, however, I actually do agree with the, the size as small as possible. Here's, here's a situation that came up in our project recently, and I think it may kind of spur more conversation about this. So we had a situation where we had to produce on an Android app a text field 
that as people are using the app and you're adding an ingredient to a recipe, for example, if it's something new that wasn't on the original or if you're adding extra or light or something like that, you had to change the the actual description. So a single line of description now turns into ingredients and it has to be in green rather than black. And if I say no tomatoes or something like that, then I need tomatoes in red but in strikeout and it's all got to be in one thing so the point is is that i we could write one given when then statement uh with just the added things and another one with just the, the removed items and yes we could have done it that way and i don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing to do however there is some overhead when you're doing the code it takes me an extra two minutes to write the formatter, to add the, f- the function to the formatter to make it in red strikeout as opposed to green, right? And so okay. it, so it, is there a return on investment, um, that you have to balance out on this? And I'm not sure I have a good answer well, for that. I think you get a return on investment at the development time when the developer sits down and they look at that story and they see one and only one acceptance criteria. They're really way less likely to miss something. And they work on it, they pass it on, QA comes in, looks at it. QA is less likely to miss something whenever they're looking at it because there's one and only one acceptance criteria that they have to check. And then, hopefully, the person who does the next piece to that, like let's say the first one did the adding and the next one does the strikeout, those guys come in. Hopefully, it's a different set of people on the team. So then you get more exposure to that piece of code. Possibly someone to come in and say, wait a minute, we have a bug here. And possibly some more forethought in there because you've had some some space in between that that says, do we really need this? Do we not need this? Is there a better way to do this? Or is there a completely different acceptance criteria that we should be looking at instead? So there's no point where the return on investment is uh, is too high or too low, not, sorry. I have not had that occur for me. Every team that I've gotten to do it consistently, and after they get used to it, they get very quick at it anyway, at saying, okay, here's how we're going to break this down. It also helps teams spend less time arguing about where do we draw the line on should this story be split or not. It's a very clear line, and it's drawn in the sand, and we're done. There's nothing more to talk about. So it's time for a new segment on This Agile Life called Let's Take a Trip to the Center of Amos Excellence, the C-O-A-E. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> so here's my phone I want to throw out there for you, Amos. And actually, John, you guys could all get on this. Uh, Real-life story, though. I was working with some folks recently. We went to their Agile tool. We pulled up an item at random. We, you know, hit the thing where it said print, which generates a PDF so you can print it and it, it formats it nicely. And this item that they were referring to as a story, when we printed it, was seven pages long. <laughs> what would you do? I would tell that well, team to make each page a different story to start out because that's a... And then to that's, make each paragraph, and then make yeah. each sentence. Well, I well, can see where this is going, Amos. Well, no, I'm saying that at the beginning, like I don't think that you take a team who is used to working on stories that are seven pages long and get them to write three-line stories with single acceptance criteria overnight. That doesn't happen well, unless you're you really lucky. But but to be to be honest, there's a lot of people out there like you know you're even talking to people at Agile 2014. There's a lot of people out there that have taken the Agile the tools out there and have turned them into you know variations of Microsoft Word. I could type a really long document in the description field, and there are these stories out there that are pretty far off the mark from what we're talking about here. So how do you get there? What would you do? I think that uh, they have that to be on Twitter. To a lot of our <laughs> they, have, they have to tweet their stories. They have to fit on Twitter. That's right. That's a, actually I don't think that's a bad idea. At least I was only try. half joking. Now I forgot what I was doing. Oh, I think that that is partially a problem with our tools. Like, we need to find better tools, write better tools, because I've seen people don't like to split stories because it takes too long, because the tool sucks at splitting. Well, or well, even creating a new story. Even if you're not splitting stories, if you're just creating new stories, it, there's a lot of overhead in the tool itself, and people get just sick and tired of it, and then they're like, screw it, just paste it all in one story and let's move on. Or the one thing that I know, actually, in this scenario I recommend it is you can configure the most tools out there to emulate elements of, of what I'm going to call story writing best practices, things that Amos will talk about in his center of excellence here. Um, <laughs> you know, like the three C's, you know, 
know, the story should fit on a card for a reason. It keeps it short. So you could configure all the tool and uh, pretty much every tool out there. There's a role out there where you could limit the length of the story. And if, you know, maybe not 140 characters, but maybe you start with 500 characters. You know, you could start to break it down. So just I don't know. I would like to challenge people to try to write some stories in 140 characters. And I, I am a Pentameter. <laughs> I am a Pentameter or whatever that. I, no, I think that I think that's a great idea. Now, again, I think just to be clear, you know, we're describing I think as best case designed for flow because things will flow through very quickly. You'll have great traceability between story and acceptance criteria because it's very simple and you can manage that. And as stories become larger, it's just harder to harder to say that if the description is verbose, do I have acceptance criteria for all the things in that description? And I would take it a step further and say, if you're writing acceptance criteria, why do you need a text based description that is not within the acceptance criteria? And if you have small stories with small pieces of acceptance criteria, it makes your product more easily moldable and your team to be more agile because you can take one small piece of that out and throw it away and say, we're not going to do this right now. And it gives you that flexibility where big stories, now you have to say, okay, well, what of this story? Oh, and I'm halfway implemented, but we still have to get this out today. What do they need out of it? And then you've got to start breaking it up later. And you're, you've already passed the last responsible moment. And it's so much easier to fill a jar completely with sand than it is to fill it with hard-boiled eggs. You're going to have more space in that hard-boiled eggs that you can't fill. Well, right, I'll to... oh, go ahead, John. Sorry, Jason. I just wanted to quickly kind of catch up on where we're at with this because I'm keeping track. I'm keeping notes. I want to make sure we, we get some good advice out there for the listeners. So, so far, here's what I've got. The three C's that Jason talked about, card, conversation, confirmation, right? So follow the three C's. So card... Yeah meaning that it should be small, small enough to fit on a 3x5 card. Conversation, meaning that it's small. You can't type a whole paragraph or document worth of text in there, so you're going to need to have a conversation, so this should be a placeholder to spur that conversation. And then the confirmation part, which was part of the advice that Amos had given, was acceptance criteria, and the recommendation right now is two to three acceptance criteria on a single story. Yeah. And the other thing I was just going to say to throw out there that, that, again, this to me is what I call Agile Reality Check. Another segment coming to this Agile Life is for everyone. And this, this is, I'm going to actually, I'm going to shift the focus here over to people more on the business side of the house. You know, product owners, BAs. Remember what the manifesto or what the principles of the manifesto tell us that business people should be working with the delivery team every day. And right. so if you adopt that and you live by that practice or that principle, then it's okay you're, to have these small stories because you'll be able to get feedback faster. But uh, again, to me, it's a telltale sign if you're in an environment when the business is not communicating well with the delivery teams. When you see these, you know, these mon- these monster stories, which again, if you dissect them as Amos was talking about, there's more than enough work to keep a team busy in one story for like a week. But you're supposed see, to be working every day together. It's easier to push a skateboard than a twelve passenger van. You got to be agile. The smaller the story, it's closer to that skateboard than the 12-passenger van. The other thing I would add to that is, uh, especially if you're trying to do something like a no estimates, then you can't have big stories because then your average story size variability goes up tremendously. So having the small stories keeps it uh, consistent. And I will almost bet that you will get less stories sent back from QA if you make small stories. All right, we want to give our listeners some more advice on creating great stories. But first, I want to tell you guys a little bit about our friends over at CodeShip. CodeShip is continuous delivery made simple. CodeShip is so simple to use, you can get your project set up and building on CodeShip in as little as three minutes. If you're not using CodeShip, then you're spending more time on continuous delivery than necessary. Our good friends at CodeShip won't even ask you for a credit card when you sign up. I know, I've done it. So what are you waiting for? I know some of you guys aren't waiting because you've already been out there and done it. And you'd like to release they, your software. It's more important to release your software, so you want to get it out there. Good. They also increased their levels on their free. That's so you, right. you get you get more builds on your free, so maybe your free maybe Amos, they're worried that they'll run into problems or that they'll have trouble getting started. Well, fear not, because <laughs> Dun, da, 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 the good people at CodeShip will swoop in and give you a hand. They have a great blog at blog.codeship.io. They have some really great videos, some helpful advice out there. You should check that out. And if all else fails, Amos always says you can tweet them and just reach they, out to them. And they will get back to you. And they will get back to you. 
And the great thing about small stories and continuous deployment is that change blindness that we've talked about a couple times in the podcast is those small stories get deployed out. Nobody notices. If you have stories that take you eight weeks to develop, people notice. Few things yeah. in life are easy, but this is one of them. Let CodeShip make continuous delivery simple for you. Go and visit CodeShip.io slash ThisAgileLife and use the code ThisAgileLife when you sign up and you'll receive a 20% discount for three months on any paid plan. Thanks to CodeShip for sponsoring This Agile Life. Okay, let, guys, let's get back into it. Jason, you were you were sounded like you were chomping at the bit. Well, I was going to chomp on that because, you know, that's one thing that I got out of, out of just a bunch of discussions at Agile 2014. That To what Amos said, it's more related to CodeShip. Yeah. And it's an interesting metric yeah. to talk about. When was the last time your team or your project released their software to production? This is, I mean, this is a fun, if you work in an environment with multiple teams, this is a fun little conversation to have. And you'll find people, that, oh, we do it every day, we do it every hour, we do it every three weeks. And really, we should be leaning forward. And, you know, there's all tools out there, CodeShip's one of them, there's probably other tools too, that you should be looking into that because you want to get feedback from users. I so. do it every time I commit with spelling errors and everything else. I just commit those and then I go back and read it. And the cool thing is, even like my company's website, I had people end up reading it right after I submit it, and they put pull requests in for my company website. Wow. Hey, I had a sort of controversial thought that I wanted to share with you guys and get your feedback. You ready? Does it involve a center of excellence? Amos will love it. <laughs> no center of excellences were harmed during the filming of this podcast. Oh, okay. We talked about the three C's, card, conversation, confirmation, talked to them about the acceptance criteria, but we also talked to them about having the team, some portion or all of the team, participate in the process of writing down story. And one of the things I, I wondered as I was doing some research and thinking about great stories today is, do I really need to write them down into, let's say, like a tool, right? Like, what's a tool? Git Kanban or Rally or version one. Is it important for me to write them into a tool? Well, unless you're going to put a string around your finger to remind you, then, yeah, you have to put it someplace that at least jogs your memory. But if you're like me, it, you like to uh, surround yourself with tools. What is it that I need to take record of or take note of to make sure that I do the thing? If you're on a small team and you guys know what you're doing and you can communicate it and your business is working with you every day and you're showing them software... I'm going to lean real real far forward here. If you're doing TDD and you write the tests, wouldn't the tests, especially maybe not at the unit level, but at like at the UAT or like if you're doing BDD, wouldn't that almost suffice as a user story? Yes. So that's where I was headed. Yeah, and, and you, that's, it, that's where I talk about the single given when then. That is yeah. a test. Yeah, the only or at least you can make it that way. The only problem is that if you're starting with that, what process? got you being able to do that if you're working with a business. So if you're like an innovation team and you're building your own product and you know everybody, you know you're like a six person startup and everyone's in the room with you, I think that would work great. If you're in a corporate IT environment where you have a budget and you're having to be managed against an IT spend plan with you know quarterly milestones and objectives and your kind of your your goals are already set for you by that process, I don't see how you could operate you just, like that. Did you just say that your goals are set by an outside group? Hold on, yeah. don't, don't go. Uh, wait, are we in an Agile podcast? Don't go, don't go <laughs> off the reservation on this. Let's no, I'm in what I call reality for a lot of people out there, okay? I, so I, I understand that, but you got to make the change somewhere, right? So where do you make that change? If we want to talk about corporate IT and having issues where other people are setting goals for them, it doesn't really matter what the stories are. They're already written. Somebody else has already decided what your goals are, and here you go. Well, and you don't have much choice. I don't think, no, but Amos, in the right way to do this, there might be high-level goals and maybe some milestones on a roadmap, but the details aren't flushed out. And that's well, why there's... Can't, can't you still do that on... What does that have to do with how... Like, what the story's written? That's what I don't understand. I don't One know. way you would have Hold five on, let me reel you guys back in here for a second. And the other way you would have a hundred tiny stories. We need the chime, John. Ding! Ding! <laughs> Uh, I, I just really don't understand how shrinking I got my story chime affects back, the back, back, to your, back to your corners, please. Bring it back in, yeah. Ah. Back to your neutral corner. <laughs> so when you have a, a, let's say, given that there's extenuating circumstances, you can be in this corporate IT environment, etc. You have a budget, you have goals, great. All that stuff is true. However, 
if we're working in a collaborative environment, right, and I have some high-level, like, targets, I have some high-level features, maybe those are on a, in a tool or they're on a spreadsheet or they're on a board somewhere, right, and I've got the product owner with me a significantly large portion of the time, do I need to write stories down? I, I still think that you need to write them down. Why? Rick, I'm, I'm going to go with John. I think, I think if you want to be forward, if you want to be forward leaning, if you're doing, if you've got a small team, everyone's involved, including the product owner, you're doing a mob and you're, you're all passing the keyboard around and you're, you have the discipline to write acceptance tests. Uh, you could generate your user stories from that retroactively because the story is sometimes a promise of a conversation. And because you sat in that meeting and decided what that story was doesn't mean that you're going to work on that tomorrow. Or it might be next week. Well, no, but Kim, I said a mob. I said we're working together continuously, so there is no meeting. So you're working together continuously, and you it's just... It's a serial process as opposed to a parallel process with multiple pairs. Yeah. Right. right. And so you're only... It's one in, one out. Yep, and as long as you have the product owner sitting there and making the decisions on the one in, then fine. Yeah. Why do you have to write them down, though, Amos? So you know you had a kind of a group of people in your in your process and in, in how you were describing it. You had a group of people all kind of locked down for a little while. They were working. They're writing stories. So what I'm challenging or what I'm asking here is, can I take that out of the room that we're doing that in, pull that back into our work area, and do it a little bit at a time? As we get to those things, so I pull the product owner over. I, I said, "Hey, we just finished this feature. Here's what it looks like. What do you think we should work on next?" I, and I, I believe. Hang on a second, and I oh, I sorry. pop open the my editor and I say, "Okay, I'm ready. I'm gonna I'm gonna write down some feature driven development, behavior driven development. Given when then, let's bang those things out. Okay, given this, given that, da da da. I write it all down. It's now is part of my code, right? That's still writing it down. Yes, but I'm talking about not writing it down in the scope of like a tool. So where where would you where would you write that down? Would you write it in code, John, as yeah, a right. as a UAT? I'd write well, it in I UAT. think that's going to take a little longer than just the discussion about about what the story is, right? It's acceptance criteria, though, right? Well, well, and how many of those are you going to write down? Like you sit down to split up that feature to start working, and mm -hmm. you call them over there. It may be shorter, smaller chunks, but what if you come up with fifteen given when thens in a five minute conversation? Yeah. So every given when then to me is a each one of those acceptance criteria is a commit point. Boom. Commit. Push it over to code ship. Deploy it. You know. Right, yeah. but you can come up with fifteen of them in five minutes, but those fifteen might take you five days to complete. So yeah. what? The other thing I think we're challenging here, and you know, I think there's a potential this could work in some environments, but I think we also have to be realistic for you know looking at how we communicate as people, how we chunk information, and how we comprehend information. And the very act of you know writing the story down on a card, or you know writing something down, and then you know that completes a you know call it a feedback loop or a learning loop, and then when you implement that. In a UAT or in code or hopefully in both, that's another loop. And so the concern I'd raise is, are we putting our comprehension of the story and what needs to be done at risk if we don't force ourselves to go through these loops by having the discipline of writing it down? And having that thinking time that I yeah, talked the, about earlier. Yeah, the thinking. It, it's a mental model Wait a piece. second. I want to challenge Amos on something here. Go for it. Go for it. The I'm just thinking time. So... Amos, what I'm hearing you say is you want to design an architecture session with your center. No, of I'm excellence. not talking about architecture. I'm not talking about the thinking time, yeah. sitting down and trying to figure out what model you're going to create here, what model you're going to create there. Well, what do you my, need to think about? My beautiful you, UML diagrams. You need to think about the acceptance criteria and how to split them up and where do they go. That's what I'm. That's what I'm doing. That's I'm actively thinking about. I'm writing well, this down. And yeah. let me point something out before this gets too far off the rails. Okay. Is I wanted to propose something radical so that you guys would have to kind of defend the position of stories so that we could talk more about what makes a story great. So I'm trying to push the engine. That's edge what of I'm trying to do, and you keep telling me to hold off. All right. <laughs> All right. All right, Jack Wagon. Now you're up. So get back in here. <laughs> it's gone. Uh, I'm over it. <laughs> see, see how I, I derailed you? Yes. So what you were saying was there's thinking time and the act of writing down that acceptance criteria 
provide you with some of that thinking time. And what I was saying was, yes, you can do some of that thinking time when you're writing down that acceptance criteria, but could also look at it as our red-green refactor cycle. In our refactor is that time where we put our thinking cap back on and think about the code and think about what we've done, right? And so we do simplest thing that can work. We're failing tests, simplest thing that can work, and then we sit back and we think, what can I do to make this improve this, et cetera, make it easier, make it simpler? And I do that. That's my thinking time. Go ahead, Lee. Different people are thinking at, at different levels. So the developers, while they're doing the code, are going to be thinking at one particular level. And it doesn't mean they can't think at a strategic level or at a feature level when given the opportunity. But if they are constantly in the middle of the code, they are not going to think as often in that larger scale. And so you have to take time to come back and change the, the scope of what you're thinking about. And in some cases, some people, uh, like your product owner, for example, will never think down in the code level. They'll only be thinking thinking at that feature level. And that's perfect. But uh, there does need to be that communication between all of the people that at whatever level they tend to be at, um, the communication of what those stories are and what the features are and what the high-level vision is. Mm -hmm. and, and you can't really do that necessarily if you're constantly in the code. But you're taking code as a literal sense there, and, and our acceptance tests, our BDD tests, are language, but also code, right? Because we codify them into executable automated tests. So I'm not asking a product owner to necessarily sit there with me and look at real code. I'm talking about having them BDD. come back. Yeah, sit down for a second. Now we think. So we pull back out of the actual code itself, and we talk about the vision. We talk about the next part of the feature or a new feature, and, and we start to decompose that into some... So how is that then. different than from the meeting? Because it's happening in real time, I see the meeting, the act of meeting, the act of getting people together and building out a series of stories to be akin to, in manufacturing, building up you, an inventory. Yeah, but, but okay, you just discussed the same thing, the exact same thing. I know I did. You said, I, you said pull them over there and sit down and write the acceptance criteria, which if we, like in my case, I believe that you should have one acceptance criteria per story. So they come to you with a feature, and you sit down right there, and you start writing these. They're still multiple stories. Yes, they're multiple stories. So I, stories. I don't see these two things as mutually exclusive. I see the meeting that you just yeah. talked about and the meeting that we talked about earlier as the same thing. Except your meeting yeah. is wasteful and mine is not. Well, wait, wait, why? I never, <laughs> talked, about, I never okay. talked about going off to another room and sitting for eight hours. Well, I, I think also okay. we have to be careful that... It seems like you're assuming, uh, John. I'm going to challenge you with some idea, mindsets from back in the, I'll say it, the waterfall days. This this idea that you can you mean do, scrum senior. Well, but yes, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, names, but. <laughs> This idea that you have perfect knowledge and the first time you go up to bat and you work on a story, you can come and you can have a solid idea. And so to me, more from the innovation space, if you've studied innovation and any of the innovation techniques that are out there, even like, take something still we talked about, having a retrospective on a team. There's a reason why, like, in the, the, the book about retrospectives by Esther Derby and Diana Larson, they talk about those five phases because there's a certain amount of reinforcement that occurs as you go through those five phases and they're, and they're linked together. My concern, John, is if you try to simplify them to a single loop, I think you're going to lose some of the creativity and innovation that can make Agile very successful. Tell me again, Jason, where I lost something in the loop. So, so I like this idea, kind of like Amos is saying, that you come together, we have a planning meeting or a turnaround or whatever you want to call it, uh -huh. and we flush out enough to get started, okay? And you write that down, okay? In a story card, in a different medium than the test or the code, okay? Then, which forces comprehension in your brain. Then you transfer that knowledge from the original medium where it was written down on the card into another medium. And so that's the second loop through that, whereby you're challenging the ideas, you're thinking about it, and you're adding value to it because it, it's going through a second cycle. And that would be if you're doing, say, acceptance test-driven development. Then you take it a step further and you actually do the implementation where you do test-driven development with unit tests. You've got that same story card with the acceptance criteria. You're going through a third loop, thinking about it, comprehending it, improving it. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned if you start to cut these loops out, I don't know if, you're, if you would be as creative and also if you would have as good quality as going through the rigors of this process. And 
you also have the ability, you're probably going to write more than one story, even when they come in and do the like little turnaround that John's talking about, and you give the agility to be able to pick the order, where if you're just doing one, 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 you never actually get that ability to step back and say, oh, well, we have these four and these four. We should probably change the priority of those, move them around in order to work for what we need now. And Agile doesn't say don't think about the future. When you're writing code, you still should probably be thinking a little bit about the future. That's what architecture and design are all about. Okay, so these are good points. So what I heard Jason and Amos say there, you guys are kind of on the same page. I'm a little shocked, but... Um, it happens way more than we like to admit. Yeah. Right. But again, Jason I'm, was it's, saying that it's how your brain works. Yeah, you're, you're saying, Jason, that people need some time to think. Some yeah. may, maybe space even between the points at which they touch these things and then, okay, now it's further down the line and I, I've had some time to think about it and now I touch it again and, and here's another opportunity for me to think on it, right? You're, so you've got some space in there for things to sink in and for you to think a little bit about that. And then Amos for your subconscious point, creative mind to take in Amos's some. point was you when you have that think time and when you maybe plan, not plan, but write a few of these out in a, in a bunch together, then it gives you some time to get them organized and lay them out in a way that logically makes sense. The thing I worry about with the, what you said, Jason, was I touch it here, I touch it there, I, I touch it a third time, was it sounded a little bit like waste because of the multiple touches, right? But, but the, touching but the, the story. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, okay, and to be clear, I'm, uh, just because someone's touched, I mean, it's not like we're doing the story again. I mean, you want to talk about the story again, let's talk about code review and if that actually adds any value. I'm saying that at each point, and again, this is a process, it's a yeah. value stream. There's different activities. So there's an envisioning activity where you take the post-it or the sketch. If you, you know, pretend you played product box, okay? So you made that or you built some Legos, you know, you did your agile game stuff and you say, okay, I want to write a story based upon this element of the Lego model. So you write that story. Awesome. You do that You do that in your Lego room as a team. Then when you go to pull that story, maybe you have a turnaround as a team, you write acceptance criteria, which is an additional layer of fidelity on top of what you already had. And maybe by team policy, the team delegates that responsibility for writing the ACs to the pair of developers that pulls the story into development. Okay, okay. so th that's not necessarily a whole team activity. That way you can go a little faster maybe and you trust that the team makes good decisions. And then after that, you do dev. So you're actually then working to build so you're adding value at all steps. I propose they're true. There is a context change, but there's no waste. I think you should have some sleep in there, too. There's a lot of studies that say learning yeah. and comprehension come from sleep. So there's a lot of creative thinking. Yeah. Or, or if anything, if you truly want to debate waste, yes, there are some context changes. But by having a handoff, you know, where maybe by team policy, a different pair, a pair that did not write the UATs does the code and the, and the, the unit testing. So you have that separation. That way you share the knowledge about the story across the team. That promotes your software assurance policy or your software assurance metrics, which I know Amos loves software assurance. So I think there's also another aspect here, which is the uh, fact that in a lot of cases, we have like a designer that's going to design how that interaction is going to occur. So a UX person. And there's more to just, oh, go create this feature. Now we want to say, oh, well, how exactly is the user interaction going to occur? Because that will dictate a lot of how we implement it. So how do you do it? Because like, because what I've been on a team where we've developed a vocabulary or lexicon for our stories where we say like as a user when I swipe up this happens and then our designer tells us what swipe up means and what that looks like and gives us like a style guide. And the stories then can be written very quickly because they're linked to that style guide and the gestures that we've adopted in the product. Well, in a lot of cases, the stories can be written in that kind of generic sort of way. But when it comes down to, to actually implementing them, sometimes those little details weren't really brought out. People didn't think down at that detailed a level, which may be the problem. Maybe our story wasn't small enough. And it's um, okay to split a story while you're implementing it. Exactly. But in a lot of cases, in some cases that uh, we actually need, we go back to our designer and say, okay, how exactly is, is this going to happen? And, uh, and they, oh, well, it's, it's going to be this tab at the top and you need to be able to both swipe and touch the tab. Okay. That sort of thing. I want to say that that last minute planning that you're talking about, John, is I say you're, you've missed the last responsible moment and by trying to be super, super agile, 
you end up being less agile because you don't have the ability to make those small decisions of what little pieces to throw away because you're only looking at one or two pieces at a time. Ooh. So, so John, we want to challenge you to go do this and come back and tell us we're all wrong. I would love to. And again, I, I think that this is super you know, out there in terms of what you would do and how you would be able to do it because there are some aspects to what I've proposed that are extraordinarily impractical. Yeah, so let me ask you this. Is how did that, if you go back to what I brought up when we started, whole team approach, uh, the one thing I'd say you have to have as a prerequisite, John, is everything that needs to be in place for your non-develop, non-developer members of the team to be able to be a member of the team. You know, if you're, if you're doing cukes, you know, you have to have step definitions set up that you have pretty language for. Because otherwise, I, I don't know how, how you would maintain a whole team approach if you're truly only communicating everything within code. Hmm. I think it's a worthwhile thing to consider because pushing the edge of the envelope in this way is, is how we make strides and in innovations in this space, right? So challenging this thinking and, and challenging us to put ourselves in the situation where we we imagine how we might operate is how we could potentially come up with new ways of doing things. And like I admitted, it, there are incredible inefficiencies here that, that we could create by doing that. There is some amount of inventory that you need just to operate on a daily basis, right? It's efficient to have a small set of stories that you're ready to work so that the team can quickly pull them and work and then refill that set of stories at some, at some interval that is convenient for everyone, especially for a product owner who's busy with a day job and other activities. And it's incredibly impractical to expect that you would ask the team to stop at multiple instances throughout the day to have these turnarounds and and discuss them. It, it might be more efficient to back that time up at a regularly occurring appointment of some sort. So I just wanted to think about it and put it out there and, and try and drive back to what are some more things and reasons why that makes stories great. What are some things that make stories great? What are some important factors that go into the reasons why we write these things down as stories? Because if we truly value conversations before we value documentation, there's a line there, and I'm trying to find where that line is, and how much time do I spend on the story, and how much time do I spend on having the conversation? Because you can write too much, and there's always the potential that you don't write enough into the story to make it usable. So I'm just challenging those things back. And or forth. you write seven pages. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> I will not write seven pages, I promise you. So the one bit of practical advice, just to make sure we hit touch on it, is that, again, I know we mentioned it right before the code ship plug, but most of the tools out there, if you have the seven-page story problem, find your tool admin, figure out how to configure the tool to limit the length of the, of the inputs or the fields, and you, you can get great usability out of all the tools out there, and you can force people to have Twitter-sized stories if you want to. I, I think there's more stories that have a link to a PDF. <laughs> Turn off the attachment option if you can. <laughs> So uh, there's also one other thing that I took from John's little thought experiment here, which we even suffer from this a bit, which is fear, right? Fear of the unknown. And uh, Agile, I think, should embrace the question everything kind of mentality that John's suggesting here. And we really should be trying as as many things as we can. And, and don't be afraid to cut your stories down. Don't be afraid to, to try something you haven't tried before. So let me throw one other one out there that maybe, well, maybe this is something to think about because I don't know if we want to get into this tonight. How do you scale it, John? Because what you're proposing works great for a small team, everyone working in the room, product owners sitting there with the team, which is what it should be, and you can collaborate and be highly innovative. That's, that's great. That works great if you're a startup, you're all six people with venture capital trying to change the world. If you're corporate IT, you know, you're doing 500 people, got the release trains rolling, how are you going to coordinate track dependencies unless you have some type of a work unit that you could use before you execute to figure out how you're going to plan? Before you answer that, John, I want to point out that it seems to be the small teams that are changing the world. Amen. Even well, I, in the big companies. I, I, I'll agree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, go, I've, I'll go read Joe Justice's blog about Wikispeed. I mean, sure, but at the same time... Is that the only option? So I don't know that it scales, and that's another excellent point, Jason, in this thought experiment. It maybe doesn't scale. Like I said, there are certain things that are inefficient about this. I would like to try that as an experiment. I wish I had a little more latitude and ability at the current moment where I could try something like this out. 
if I did have a little more autonomy in that case, I would try it at least in a in maybe in some isolated cases and see. One of the things that I was thinking about as I was driving home tonight was why doesn't a tool, some sort of tool out there, help me quickly take like a story and magically marshal it over into into like a new feature file for me where it you know immediately creates me a feature file with all of my acceptance tests in the given when then format so that I could just maybe push a button and it'll create my feature file with my acceptance criteria and then put a little tag on it uh say this is you know story seven fifty five and and give me some some amount of traceability that I could go with. So to any of the Agile lifecycle management tool vendors out there, if you want to put in a new killer feature, maybe you can give us the ability to quickly export stories out to feature files. There are a couple of Cucumber plugins that put up web pages that you can go write given when thens on the web page and save them off as tests. All right. run. Yeah. Or to the credit of the tool vendors, all of them have APIs that you could easily do that, John. So you'd have to call the API like from your IDE. You'd have, to, you'd have to tell it what the story number is, but then it could go out to the tool and suck in the information and spit things out for you. You're missing it, though. I don't want to do any actual work here, Jason. I just want somebody <laughs> to do the work. You have to the say, make a new... <laughs> you have to go to the tool, say, ah, better yet. Okay, you'd have... You have to push that somehow. Say, if you pulled the card over, could you trigger an event by pulling the card over where it would push you data. That's yeah, probably... Yeah, yeah. it's... You could broker some stuff to do that, but no. All right, here's a recap then because we're going to we're gonna cut this off and go and do our pick. I have drawn a beautiful picture of it. That's wonderful. Here, here's a recap of what we, what we talked about. We talked about the three Cs, card, conversation, confirmation. We talked about stories having a minimum number of... some small maximum number of acceptance criteria. Amos suggested one, maybe just two or three, no ands, no ors. This is to help you create great stories, have smaller sets of acceptance criteria, forces you to have, I think that also forces you to have stories that are approximately the same size, too, when you keep them with a small number of acceptance criteria. And then one of the things that we talked about was the act of documenting your story, the act of transitioning the story through your workflow is important because it gives you some time to think, some time to digest the ideas that are contained and documented within that story. And it also gives you a way to be a little organized. And you can say, okay, let's do this piece of it first, then let's do this one after that. And, and having that think time, having that time for the story to kind of incubate gives you that opportunity to get organized. Anything else, guys, that you want to add in there? But I think, John, I would just say, and again, since the uh, the big Agile conference was within the last month or so, there's always a learning track there. And, and one thing that is interesting about Agile, Agile is a process based upon learning. So all of these feedback loops that we're talking about in the story process are, in, at least in my opinion, they are intentional because they're there to facilitate learning about what we're actually trying to do. And so, again, if you're writing stories, you're writing code, and you're on an Agile team, and you're not learning about the code, you're not learning about the product as you're building it, then I'd raise the flag that you're probably doing something wrong and would be well advised to get some help to figure out why you're not learning as you go through an iterative process as we're describing. So let's go ahead and do our picks tonight, and let's start with Amos. This week's hottest picks. Giant Robot Smashing into Other Giant Robots blog has a post called Sandy Metz's Rules for Developers. It's pretty good. It's got four little rules that Sandy Metz puts out. She didn't really like putting them out. Uh, rules are meant to be broken, though. She basically says follow these until you get some other pair on your team to agree. And uh, they talk about what that did to their code. It's pretty interesting. Uh, my second pick is uh, Rest in Peace, the 11th Doctor. Matt Smith from Doctor Who is gone. I'm going to miss him. He's crazy. And then my last pick is a little shameless self-promotion. It's my company website. I finally got it up. Yes, I should hire a designer. BinaryNoggin.com. Check it out. If you see any typos or have some suggestions for me, let me know. Is it like using the same crappy theme that Dirty Information uses? Oh, you mean none? No. <laughs> no. Oh, dude, That's... it talks about purveyors. Yes. No. Dirty Information is uh, is just that. It's dirty information. Dirty. It's, it's meant to look horrible. Thanks, Amos. Jason, what are your picks? Oh, you went out of order. Okay. I'm, Ooh, I'm, over, I'm over checking out Amos. I'm going to check out Amos's. I have three. <laughs> 
For fun, I taught my four-year-old the Scaled Agile Framework. It's on YouTube, so go watch it. From, uh, I think probably had to be one of my favorite activities or sessions at the Agile 2014 conference back in Orlando in August was a session by Lynn, uh, Casley. She did a session about drawing, which I've really gotten into. So as we were talking about stories tonight, I got my own sketch over here that I'll figure out how to scan. I'll take it down to the basement, scan it, and we'll put that on the show notes. Uh, just as a way to do di- different things with visual thinking, including, you know, we right, today we, tonight we talked about writing stories. You can actually make stories as pictures. They work very well. Lynn's got a book out called Visual Mojo. Uh, we'll put a link to where you get on Amazon. It's a great book. And again, if you don't think you can draw, the way you learn to draw is you have to practice, and it's actually pretty easy. And the last one I'll throw out there is another fun video. It's called A Conference Call in Real Life. And it's a great thing to watch if you're in an environment where you do a lot of um, phone sessions, not necessarily face-to-face sessions with Skype or, go- or, um, or Google Hangout. Watch the video and um, you'll understand why it's really good that the Agile Manifesto challenges us to give preference to face-to-face communication versus just talking on the phone. Those are my three for tonight. That's all I have. I love the conference call in real life video. It's one of my all-time favorites. If you've spent 10 minutes on a conference call, you will love every bit of that YouTube video. Okay, Lee, what are your picks? So my picks happen to be a couple specific XKCD comics. I know that anybody that listens to this, I don't have to plug XKCD. So I wanted to bring uh, attention to a, a couple of really good ones that I like. One is uh, entitled Good Code, How to Write Good Code. It's number 844, if you go check that one out. And then there's one uh, on Git Commit, uh, which is 1296. And uh, those are both some really great comics if you want to check it out. I can't believe it. I think that's maybe our first KCD pick. Well, I guess we had just assumed that everybody already knows XKCD. Except it's really, really hard to keep saying XKCD. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. My pick tonight is Assembla. I think that's how you say it. It's another one of these Agile lifecycle management tools, or at least a team, uh, team collaboration, team working tool. You know, gives you the ability to create stories like we talked about tonight. Uh, Can you draw pictures in it? Hmm, good question. I don't know if you can draw pictures. You'll have to check it out. It's got some social aspects to it, like Slack, I think, right? It has some social stuff in it. Oh, Slack. We love Slack. Oh, not. (laughs) Uh, It's got some integration with your Git repo, Subversion, whatever you're using. It just looked nice, looked kind of neat. I like to throw these out there to people, let them check it out. One of the interesting things about this one in particular is it seems to be geared towards companies that are working for a client, kind of like uh, pro- doing project work because it has the ability to, to make some of this information very easily available to clients. So if you happen to be in a, an organization where you're doing project work for clients, maybe this will be a fit for you. Check it out, assembla.com. I've got a link to it in the show notes. And as usual, I just have the one pick. All right, guys. Well, okay, that's all we have time for today. Check out thisagilelife.com for these show notes and for all of our past episodes. Thanks for listening and keep living this agile life. This Agile Life is brought to you by a community of agile developers and coaches aspiring to spread the word about this groundbreaking approach to software development. Join us at thisagilelife.com forward slash community.